Hello, I'm Sean Fisher, and I'm the pastor and teacher here at Bloomfield Congregational Church. I'm reintroducing myself because a number of you may not normally attend this service and may be only tuning in for this message and have missed the introduction, or maybe catching this message after the service is over and just be connecting to this message. Welcome. It's a blessing that you are here. About a week ago, a little over a week ago, I just couldn't sleep. And I was drawn to go read my Bible late into the evening, and I ended up at a passage that I didn't really understand why I was being drawn to that passage. It's not really a familiar one. But then this week, I heard the words and the proclamation from the Vatican against the LGBTQ community, and I understood why this passage had been brought to my attention. I have so many friends who have been injured physically, spiritually, emotionally by religious leaders who try to say some people are in and some people are out, or some people's behavior is unacceptable and other people's behavior is acceptable simply because they were born children of God the way God created them. You may be one of those people who are injured. You may be someone who knows people who are injured or be concerned that someone you love may be injured as a result of this. This is a serious message dealing with adult concepts. We will be talking about sex. We will be talking about suicide. We'll be talking about very serious things, so I leave it to your judgment and your consideration for who it is appropriate to see this. God has something to say to you, to say to the world about this in this moment, and I hope that this message has meaning for you. Would you join me in a word of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts Bring you glory, God, and all the diversity of your creation. Amen. So today, the passage that we are talking about comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 20, and begins with verse 27. And it starts, Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked Jesus, a question. So before we get any further, we need to understand who are the Sadducees. Because sometimes people mix up different terms for different religious groups and different cultural groups back in Jesus' time. Some people say, oh, the Sadducees and Pharisees, like they were all one thing, or the scribes and the high priests, like they were all one thing. They were not. The Sadducees were not equal to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were kind of the rabbis of the time, the people amongst the people, the ones who helped interpret the law for people's daily lives. They were the ones that people listened to the most. The Sadducees were a combination of priests that came from the line of Zadok, as well as a bunch of wealthy aristocrats. Now, originally, back this line, this priestly line tied their line all the way back to Aaron, who was the brother of Moses. And this combination, after the people of Israel were exiled to Babylon and spent 70 years in captivity, after they were released from captivity, this line of priests came back and were the ones who led the temple that was rebuilt in Jerusalem. Now, by the time Jesus' time, about 33 A.D., that this group had become smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of their tightening of their circle. And this group of priests tied to this wealthy aristocratic class had decided to use their power to control and oppress other people for their own benefit. Because of the central power of the temple, because people were taught that the only way to get good with God was to come to the temple and make your sacrifice, that your sins could only be forgiven in this way, that you could only be good with God if you did this. There was tremendous control that they had, and they exerted religious, economic, and social control. Because if you didn't 
do what they said. You were out and you were cast out from society and you were unable to be part of society. And they used this power to oppress the most vulnerable people. This group here, this group of high priests and aristocrats were the top 1% of their time. And though called to protect the most vulnerable people, as Jesus continually pointed out, as other people continually pointed out, as the people who were being oppressed pointed out, as the Pharisees pointed out, they continued to use their power as the top 1% to manipulate and oppress the vulnerable people they were supposed to be protecting. So these Sadducees came up to Jesus and said, Teacher, in a sarcastic way, because they're trying to set Jesus up. Teacher, Moses wrote, and they're focusing on Moses because they focus on the law of Moses because that is where their priestly line ties back to. Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow, and raise up children for his brother. Now here is the riddle. Now there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? Well, first off, it's not a serious question. And how do we know that? Because at the very beginning, when they describe the Sadducees, they say right up front that they don't believe in a resurrection. And so the question is meant to trap Jesus. Why would they want to do that? Because just in one chapter earlier, Jesus had gone into the temple and turned over all these tables and where people were collecting money and turned over these tables of the money changers who were abusing the people who were exchanging money there at the temple for people who had to buy animals so that they could do the sacrifice. And he was releasing all of these animals that were being sold to people at an exorbitant price because you could only be sure that your animal was of enough quality to count for the sacrifice if you got it from the temple priest. And Jesus said, how can you be abusing the temple in this way, charging and saying, Oh, the only way you can do this is by getting a flawless animal, and the only way you could know your animal was flawless is if they said so. So you'd buy the animal, but you couldn't use the money of the temple, so you had to use the money changers, and then they wouldn't give you a very good exchange rate. Ways to oppress the most vulnerable. And Jesus went in there and said, this is unjust. This isn't what is meant to be. You are abusing your privilege as people who are running the temple. So he turned over all these tables and released all these animals. And these people, who are the 1%, having their control and their money at risk, decided he's got to go. And so they posed this, trying to trick him into giving an answer that would get him into trouble. <clears throat> so these Sadducees were focused on the law of Moses, which is the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, because that's where their line went back to, back to Aaron, the brother of Moses. And these people didn't believe in resurrection, and so they posed this riddle and said, the first man who was married to this woman, he died and they were childless. Then the second, then the third, then the fourth. By the time you get to the fifth, you've got to think that the fifth brother is getting nervous at this point. And the sixth and the seventh, and they all end up not bearing a child with this woman. Now, this was a tradition back then, not just in the people of Israel, but the Hittites and the Canaanites also did this because back then, I mean, childbirth is dangerous now, but back then, it was serious danger. And so finding ways to make sure a family line or a tribal line or that the people could continue was a big deal. And the Sadducees based this law, and they based this law on two passages in the Torah, Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 6, and Genesis 38, 8. 
and I'll have you hear those now. In Deuteronomy 25, starting with verse 5 through verse 6, it says, When brothers reside together, and one of them dies and has no son, not just childless, but has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. So not only were they saying the brother, but they didn't want the woman to get away from the family so they could continue growing their family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, shall have sex with her, taking her in marriage and performing the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the firstborn whom she bears shall succeed to the name of the deceased brother, so that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. And in Genesis 38, then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her. Raise up offspring for your brother. And this was done to try to continue the family line or the tribal line or to keep the people alive. Now this was a law that was written some range, but like 1,600 to 2,000 years before Jesus. 1,600 to 2,000 years before Jesus, which means this was written like 3,600 years ago from today. 3,600 years ago to 4,000 years ago from today. And Jesus is hearing all of this and hearing this riddle and all the stuff they're trying to do to him. And what's his reaction to it? Shake my head. What are you trying to to do. He's like, you missed the whole point. I get you're trying to trap me, but you have missed the point of what is being said here. You have missed the point that God is trying to make it. What is possible with God? He's like, yes, back 1,600, 2,000 years before my birth, yes, you didn't want to lose the family line or the tribal line, and yes, you didn't want to lose the woman from the family back there 1,600 years before my birth. But he goes on to talk about a new age and says, but things change. Maybe this was necessary 1,600 years ago, 2,000 years before my birth. It's like, but things change. New ages come. New times come, and God sees you differently. God sees people differently than we see people here on earth. The Sadducees were focusing on a couple of lines, a couple of verses from their Bible, from their Torah, from the first five books of the Bible. And God's trying to say, like, hey, hey, I'm over here, I'm over here, I'm trying to tell you a bigger story than just a couple verses, a couple verses from the Bible. Do you ever see that today? Do you ever experience that today where you hear someone say, well, these people are out. It's usually about exclusion. This person's doing something really, really, really bad, and so we condemn them. This person's doing something really, really, really bad, so we're keeping them out and excluding them. It's almost always saying something bad or excluding somebody. They're saying, see, they're out, and it's because of book X, you know, the book of X, chapter 5, verse 2, or some verse, and they're very definitive about it. It can be so declarative. You might say, wow, they really have some authority about this and make you feel defensive and step back. Then if you just think about what God is really about, that God is love, that God is in the business of love. You say, um, but, 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 what about this God over here that we hear about over here? But they'll say, no, you can't change that, it's in the Bible. What are you trying to do, reinterpret Scripture? Are you trying to say that one of these things isn't accurate? You need to find this, because I've been hearing a lot about that kind of thing since I've posted on Facebook in support of some of the rights after the Vatican made their statement. After posting about what this message was going to be. 
Who are you to reinterpret the scripture? Who are you to talk about this? They're the ones that know what they're talking about, not you. Maybe so, that's for you to decide. But I have a question for you, and I have a question for those who are criticizing the re-look at this passage and the re-look at how broad love can go when it comes to relationships in this new age, 4,000 years removed from when that law was written. How many of you and how many of the people who you think were criticizing me, if they were married and the husband died and the woman didn't have a child, would be signing up to be committing to only stay with the husband's side of the family, and if there was a brother, to only have relationships, sexual relationships with that brother or another brother or another brother from that family so she could have a child there, even if he was married to somebody else. I'll tell you what. My wife and my brother like each other. My wife and my brother love each other. But if I had died before my son was born, do you think that my wife was going to say, yes, I'm going to just stay with your side of the family and I'm going to go with your brother and the rest of his family so that you can go ahead and have a child that's under your name? No. I wouldn't want her to do that. I would want her to go and find someone who she loved. And that's what would be encouraged by other people, including including the Catholic Church, including other churches, wouldn't expect that law from back there to be enforced today. It's absurd. That is not what would happen if the Vatican, earlier this week, declared that some people's love in this new age, in an age where God sees people differently, that God honors love, and God creates all people, and people are created the way God intended for them to be created, said that when two people of the same gender love each other, and I'm not trying to exclude people who are non-binary, I include you in this as well, But the declaration was that we will not bless same-sex marriages. So let's talk about this for a second. The Vatican declared that if two men love each other and God is love and God wants people to love each other, that if there is this love, no, you cannot have that. And not only did they say that, they didn't just say we won't bless it, they said it is sinful. And if two women, or a combination, depending on how you self-identify, love each other, the Vatican said, no, not only will we not bless it, which they could have stopped it, that says, no, it is sinful. Okay. Let's go there. Let's talk about sin. There are different ways to look at sin. One is that there's this sin list, right? Back in, there are all kinds of rules and regulations, and there is a sin list. No, don't do X, don't do Y, don't do Z, definitely don't do Z. Or in addition to this, yeah, you got to do this, don't do this. And by the way, don't ask any questions. That's the response that I was talking about that I've been getting a lot of. Who are you to ask questions about what the Vatican says? Who are you to ask questions about what the Bible says? Who are you to ask questions about what has been said? Nothing will fade away from the rule. Really? Well, what about that rule about the different brothers and what you would do if your husband died or your significant other died. You're going to be obligated to go to their side of the family and stay with them? I don't think so. But there is a different way to look at what is sin. And I think this is a broader and a more powerful one. 
Not one that gets us off the hook, but that one is more compelling and more commanding and one that makes sense, but is also more demanding in some ways. And that is this. Sin. Being anything that you do or I do that separates us from God. Things that we do that take us farther away from doing the good things that allow the world to be a better place, that allow us to become the people that God intends for us to be the way we were created with the potential to be who God dreams for us to be. If we move away from that path, move away from God, that is one definition of sin. If we do something that hurts another person, that separates us from a healthy relationship with another person. Not talking about getting away from an abusive relationship, that's a good thing, but if we do something that cuts us off from a good relationship with other people, that can be sinful. If we do something that separates two people from a healthy relationship, I mean, if we do something and two people should be in relationship and we separate them and we cause that to be difficult, that is sinful. Or if we do something to separate someone else from God, that is sinful. So let's look at that definition and how that impacts things in the context of the conversation about the sinfulness of these relationships in the Vatican's proclamation today. When religious organizations and leaders make proclamations like this against the LGBTQ plus community, certain things happen that study after study shows. More people run away. There is more homelessness. And this runaway and homelessness because people are being rejected. They're being rejected by their families. They're being rejected by their churches. There's some people being rejected by their youth groups because all of a sudden they hear someone make a declaration like this and they find out that their friend is like, oh, that is evil, that is sinful. I can't be friends with you, so the people run away or they're homeless. That is separating people from other people and that is sinful. Separating people from potentially healthy relationships that they could have. In addition to increased runaways and increased homelessness and increased rejection, there's an increase in hate crimes. And I'm not saying that the Vatican wants increase in hate crimes against people. But when people hear that a group of people are being called sinful, that they are not good in the eyes of God, some people will go and do violence on these people. It happens all the time at a disturbing rate. In addition to all that, calls go up to suicide hotlines almost immediately after these declarations take place. In addition to that, over time there's an increase in suicides as a result of positions like this and declarations like this. You know what the policy of the Catholic Church is if someone commits suicide? You're not allowed to enter the kingdom of God. So you put forward a declaration that separates people from their faith community, separates people from God, separates people from healthy relationships with other people, and then condemn them if their situation is so dark and so desperate that they think this is their only way out? I can't think of a bigger sin in this world than what is being done by the Vatican here to the LGBTQ community. To be claiming that they have the power and the right to say this and interpret this and then hurt people and do all of these things, separating people from God, separating people from healthy relationships. And ultimately, through this sin, separating them, their own selves, the Vatican, from God. Vatican is doing something very similar to what was being done here. When you say you have the exclusive decision over what is right 
and what is wrong. They are oppressing the youth. These are the people who have the greatest threat of suicide, the greatest places of increased occasions of suicide and suicidal thoughts after statements like these. The LGBTQ plus population, particularly the young, are the ones at the greatest risk. The people we are called to protect. Doing something that increases all of these things to the people we are supposed to protect. It separates them from their support systems. It separates them from a belief in God that can help them in their situation with a healthy relationship. What can be more sinful than that? Children who are in the LGBTQ plus community, who have families with religious values that don't say negative things about that community, have half the suicide rate of the average person in that population. People who are in families who hear these kind of declarations that there is something wrong with their relationship, something wrong with their love in this new age given by God, who they are as children beloved by God as they are, have twice as high a risk of suicide. This is wrong. A month ago, we celebrated the seventh anniversary of this community of faith becoming an open and affirming community of faith. Meaning we embrace people from the LGBTQ plus community, people of all, all races, all levels of ability, all genders, all kinds of, any name of things that you can think about, we affirm you and welcome you and bless you and welcome you here, but that's one thing to say that. If anything is being made perfectly clear by this situation this week, it is that this is a time that we need to step up. It is one thing to put it on our bulletins, it is one thing to put it on flags outside, but it is another thing to fully live into our open and affirming commitment as a community of faith, because it is more than just people feeling welcome. So that's important. It's more than having a place where people feel like they can belong, though that is profoundly important. It is about letting people know that as they are, as they are created, that they are beloved children of God, loved equally, and that their love in this new age is just as beautiful as any that there is, and they are not sinful, and that we embrace and hope that they will find a partner and a love as beautiful as anybody else's. And it is important because more than that, there are lives at risk. We need to go out and use our voices and what we have at our disposal and our resources to let people know they are loved. And this doesn't represent what is out there for their lives. This is what we are called to do as a community of faith. This is what it means to be part of a community of faith, to go out and help the people who are the most vulnerable. And this is one of the ways that we can do it powerfully. And so I call on myself. I call on our community of faith to say that we will step forward and do something about this. I won't dictate that on my own. That's not how we are structured, but together. And I invite any of you watching today to be a part of that if you would like to to help us make sure that love wins. Amen.